God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're going to study several passages in the word of truth uh, this uh, morning hour. Uh, turn first of all to Matthew chapter 28. Every believer is a priest, and every believer priest has the privilege of personally and privately preparing himself for the study of the Word of God. Using the principle of 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sin grieves or quenches the Holy Spirit, making it impossible for him to teach you. However, if you confess your sins, the finished work of Christ on the cross guarantees that you will be restored to fellowship, and being restored to fellowship, you will be taught by the Holy Spirit, who is the author of the Word of God. Therefore, we'll spend a few moments in silent prayer as you prepare yourself for the, the, this magnificent work uh, that God has uh, of teaching you, as a member of the human race, the uh, Word of the living God. Let us pray. Once again, Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is for us to handle the infallible, inerrant Scripture, the mind of Jesus Christ, the voice of the Spirit, the Word of the living God, the revelation that has been given to us in the original manuscripts that speak to us and give to us every revelation that you want us to know. Therefore, we set aside this time, this morning hour, to give ourselves to the study of this portion of the Word that we're going to look at. May believers be helped to advance spiritually as we study, I ask in Jesus' name, Amen. In our exegesis of Galatians chapter 1, we have progressed all the way through the first verse and the second verse, which says, to the churches of Galatia. This has introduced us to the doctrine of the church. And we are now ready. I have not uh, taught all the ten points since I have taught it in the past, and it will be in a booklet on the church, which should be ready by next weekend. And it will also be an appendix in the word by word, verse by verse study of the book of Galatians, which is also going to be available for those who'd like to have a copy of it. But the, we have studied all these various points, but now finally, a point that I've mentioned earlier, and I'm referring to now, the church as the center for Bible teaching. Let me refer again to something that Dr. J. Vernon McGee uh, wrote way back in February of 1986. He's now with the Lord, but at that time he was actively, still uh, actively teaching the Word of God over his daily radio program uh, and uh, producing a, m a monthly publication, which I got. And you know, one of the things that uh, uh, impressed me, and I, have, I, I, this has, I wish I had said it. <laughs> he says this, uh, just a portion. He says, During our five weeks of conference ministry in the East, South, and Canada, we had opportunity to talk to Christian leaders and laymen of both conservative and liberal viewpoints from all over the Christian world. Also, we met a few politicians. Conservative Christianity is a hodgepodge. We have Disneyland doctrine Tinker Toy Theology, Hollywood Holiness, Lollipop Liberalism, and a Mirage of Miracles. Satan is also using Eastern religion to gain a foothold into the churches. They teach that our environment is to be worshipped. 
New organizations have arisen in the past years using high-pressure methods to raise money. Competition among Christian organizations is mean, underhanded, loaded with strife and envy. It's a scandal. They talk love, but hate is in the heart. Christ ceases to be the center of Christianity. Christianity is being changed. Bible teaching is simply not the popular way to go. Many forms of so-called Bible teaching are substituted for the real thing. Teaching about the Bible is not Bible teaching. Teaching from the Bible is not Bible teaching. Paul said, preach the Word. So-called Bible teaching is becoming entertainment. Music no longer contributes to the worship and the ministering of the Word, but as a separate entertainment feature. Where is all this taking us? Not to revival or to spiritual growth. In the meantime, the show must go on. Pray that God will raise up a man or men and women with courage to speak the truth regardless of the, tr the, tr uh, the uh, cost. The church has been infiltrated through false ideas. Where does the concept of the, we talked in the last hour about the, the four words which are used for the pastor-teacher. Where does the concept come of the pastor doing visitation? That's not a biblical principle. That comes from Romanism. It doesn't come from the word shepherd at all. The shepherd feeds the, the flock. The shepherd protects the flock. The shepherd... Uh, governs the flock. The shepherd doesn't visit the flock. Where does it come from? It comes from the Roman priest who had nothing to do but deliver a little homily every so often as well as to celebrate the Mass and go around and check up on his congregation. You take the concept even of Christian education. Where wh What is the responsibility for the teaching of children in Scripture, parents. Now, obviously, if, if the church is to teach the body of Christ, the royal family of God, then we recognize that some of the church is young and some of the church would we'll just say older. We'll never say old, but older. And... Since children are born again, many times uh, at ages uh, three, four, five, then they need to be taught as well as adults. And because their vocabulary is different, we find specialized teachers who will, in the church, communicate the Word of God to the young. And so it is that... Uh, uh, the classes accommodate a special need, but uh, they, it, this does not uh, mean that the uh, that uh, the church is taking over the responsibility of parents, but augmenting it. And as we we don't call our Sunday school, we call it prep school, uh, we're short for preparation, and the classes for the young children are preparatory for them to become uh, a part of this class where they will understand uh, as they learn the vocabulary, as they mature, as they learn basic doctrines, uh, as they come to the place where they can take their place uh, along with some of our young people who are uh, now of the age that they can do so. And so the principle of uh, uh, the classes for the young is not anti-biblical, but the concept of Christian education uh, is definitely not taught in Scripture as far as what the common concept of Christian education is. Uh, we also uh, use our program for evangelism of children, which is uh, legitimate. Revival services or evangelistic campaigns are man-made additions to the church. Believers are to give out the gospel, not the local church. However, the pastor-teacher is to give out the gospel whenever he teaches the Word of God and there are unsaved people there. Many churches today are adding professional counselors to the staff. 
Pastors are going back to school so they can become psychological counselors for troubled members of their congregation as well as outsiders. However, pastors are to preach the word and not counsel or use one-on-one -on -one teaching. Large, ornate, expensive buildings in order to attract people is phony motivation. People should attend a congregation not because it's a friendly church or because it's convenient, because it's a place where the Word of God is taught. If a building attracts someone, then a better building will attract them to something else. Bake sales, fish fries, rummage sales, bazaars are man-made additions to the local church. And it's no wonder that the people in the community don't know whether it's the church is in the bakery business, the restaurant business, the junk business, the clothing business, or what business it's in, because they do so many things, it confuses everyone. There are so many other insidious additions, counting heads, entertainment, social action, activism, ecumenism, denominationalism, emphasis on money, women usurping authority, on and on ad nauseum. What does the New Testament teach? Well, let's begin by looking at what our Lord Jesus Christ had to say as the first of the real statements regarding the church. Well, let's make it the second. The first was made in Matthew chapter 16 when he said he would build his church. He would build his church, which made it future to the time of his incarnation at the day of Pentecost. And uh, it would be his church, not ours. Now this is his second statement in Matthew chapter 28. The Lord Jesus Christ has been resurrected from the dead. This is before his ascension. So between his resurrection and his ascension, he gathers them together. And in verse 18, he says, All authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. And then we read, let me read there uh, from the New International Version. Therefore... Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The first mistake is that this does not say uh, uh, go. Uh, it says in verse uh, 19, uh, the English here says, therefore go. The therefore is correct. And it, it's, uh, it does reach back and uh, take us uh, to the previous statement. It's the preposition un, O-U-N, looks like this in the Greek. And it always refers to something in context. And the context goes back to the fact that he has the authority. And under his authority, which is now delegated to the believer, something is to be done. But the word go here appears to be an imperative whereas it is actually an aorist passive participle. Uh, the word peruomai looks like this in the Greek. P-O-R-E-U-O-M-A-I does mean to go, but the morphology is very important here. The aorist tense, the passive voice, and the participial form. The aorist participle always precedes the action of the main verb. So that when you see an aorist participle, you have to translate it. A participle is a verbal adjective. It should be translated like a verbal adjective. You can't translate it go. It has to be translated like a verbal adjective. And so it has to be translated in the aorist tense, having gone. Passive voice, the subject receives the action of the verb. The believers receive this action. They're, go they're having gone. They are to uh, be being responsible. Uh, having gone on your way. Now, the main verb is the word disciple. So, he, before, you, before you disciple, you have to have gone. So, having gone, uh, assuming the obedience uh, of the believer, uh, having gone, it says, then disciple. This is the aorist imperative of mathetuo. Looks like this in the Greek. M-A-T-H-E-T-E-U-O. This is the eta, this is the epsilon, so we make a different shade. You may call that an A. Mathetuo, translated disciple. Now, mathetuo is very interesting. It has several meanings, but it always means to be a student, 
It means to be a learner, but it also has uh, the idea of being an adherent to a particular teacher and uh, therefore uh, to the instruction which that teacher gives. See, uh, Socrates had uh, disciples, uh, uh, Plato had disciples, and they all had disciples. The, the Old Testament prophets had disciples. You notice one thing. You don't see this word anywhere in the epistles. It doesn't appear. The idea is that discipleship was related to our Lord Jesus Christ, but it is not related to this dispensation in which we live. Why? Because discipleship was unique. And if, if we understand that discipleship means to make a student, to make a learner, to make an adherent to my instruction, then all right, use it in that form. But the idea of one person going out and making another person a disciple by becoming his soul is not biblical. You don't make, you, nobody can live on the soul of somebody else. You cannot live on decisions that other people make. You cannot attend Bible class because somebody says, where were you last Sunday? Where were you on Tuesday night? Where were you on Thursday night? You come on the basis of your own soul and not because someone puts a pressure on you. And so the idea here in the aorist imperative, the imperative is the mood of command. God is giving a command, having gone or having gone on your way, uh, make uh, disciples or make adherents to my instruction. That would be the best translation of the, of the actual meaning. To make it into a disciple confuses the issue. Uh, make adherents to my instruction. Now, how is it to be done? Well, he gives two ways, and those are in the form of present participles. And the two present participles, one is baptizing, and the other is teaching. The word baptizing is the aorist, uh, pardon me, the present active participle from uh, the word baptizo. It looks like this in the Greek. B-A-P-T-I-Z-O. Immediately. Look at it. All they have done is to transliterate it into English. It has not been translated. And it's not legitimate to simply transliterate a word. You've got to translate it. What does it mean? What does it mean to baptize? Well, it depends upon the group. Sprinkle if you're Methodist or Presbyterian. Uh, use a fusion if you're uh, Mennonite or uh, Holy. You have them go down in the water and pick it up and drop, uh, uh, do drop it on them. Um, I noticed in the film, Jesus film, which put out by Campus Crusade, which we're using in our uh, kids' uh, TV program, that when the Lord Jesus Christ came to John the Baptist for his unique baptism uh, and others that... Uh, he, he didn't baptize any of them. They all just knelt down into the water. And uh, I wondered how John could baptize if they knelt down by themselves. But then I'm not going to argue with Campus Crusade or whoever produced the film. But uh, the word baptism does not have anything to do with uh, uh, water in itself. By application it does. The word baptizo means to identify with. The illustrations are uh, uh, of uh, that is used a, a a ship that goes into the water becomes identified with the water. A swimmer who drowns becomes identified with the water. A sword which is placed in a pot of blood is identified with that. A a city which is uh, on the brink of of uh, destruction is identified with the destruction. It is in a word of identification. And there are seven baptisms in Scripture. Seven different baptisms. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we've already seen, is one of the ten unique features of the church age. 
between the day of Pentecost and the day of the rapture, there are ten things which never took place anywhere in the past and will never take place again. They are going to take place only between Pentecost and the rapture. They are unique to the church. They are unique possessions which belong to the church. And the first one is the baptism of the Holy Spirit in which God, the Holy Spirit, takes the believing sinner and places him into union with Jesus Christ. He identifies the believer with union Christ, with, with, in union with Christ, so that we are said to be in him. 130 times in the New Testament, we talk about positional truth, being in Christ, in him, in the beloved one. 130 times. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And water baptism for the church age believer is the ritual which teaches the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a, uh, uh, an emotion. It is not an ecstatic. It is not speaking with tongues. It has nothing to do with a feeling of any kind. It is the work of the Holy Spirit in which he places the believing sinner in the union with Christ. In water baptism, the water is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the believer is immersed in the water, it is identification with Jesus Christ in his death. And when it, he comes out of the water, it is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, identification with Jesus Christ in his resurrection. So it means identification. Now, when it is used in this case, and, and he uses it purposely, for it is, it is to combine evangelism with the response of evangelism positively, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, or the faith response to the evangelism and the subsequent obedience to the Lord in identifying with him in believer baptism. So he wraps it all up in one word. And so the first work of the church is to evangelize. And of course, subsequently then, to help that person to identify with the Lord Jesus Christ in a public way. Baptism is not the issue. The issue is really uh, leading them to the place where they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we have the second participle, which is teaching. So evangelize and to teach. Teach is the Greek word didasko. Looks like this in the Greek. D-I-D-A-S-K-O. Didasko means to, uh, uh, to hold a discourse with a group. Uh, that is... Uh, and in the present tense, just as the uh, continuing evangelism, it is to be continued throughout this church age. It is to be taught, teaching. Teaching of what? Teaching of the Word of God. Well, perhaps Acts 2.42 would help us to understand a little bit more uh, as to what they continued to do as an early church. So turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at a few verses very quickly. We shan't exit all them. I will have them all in the in the booklet. But uh, Acts chapter 2 talks about the early church. And when uh, we find um, those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, in verse 41, uh, Acts 2, 41, those who accepted his message were baptized. There is the baptism. That's the first part of the command. And were about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now verse 42. They, these the new people, these 3,000 plus the others, they devoted themselves uh, to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. We have four things here, but the word that is important is proskarateo. Looks like this in the Greek. P R O S K A R E T E O, which is translated devoted themselves. Uh, uh, pros is the preposition meaning face to face. Uh, karateo means to be steadfast. To be steadfast face to face with something. It has the idea of, uh, plus the fact that this, by the way, is a present participle, uh, indicating again that is something that continued. They kept on being steadfast face to face. Or, as the New International says, they were devoted. Uh, New American Standard says that they were continually devoting themselves. Better translation, continuously devoting themselves to. This is the thing that they devoted themselves to. I want you to notice what's not there. 
Where is worship found? Worship is found in John chapter 4, verse 20, where the Lord Jesus Christ says that we, we move from corporate worship to individual worship. The church is not here to worship. The church is here to continue in doctrine, the uh, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Breaking of bread is communion. Those four things. The believer worships the Lord in spirit and in truth, which doesn't mean the church can't worship. But that's not the, the purpose of the church. The church is to be a center for, obviously, the teaching of the apostles' doctrine. They persisted face-to-face -face with. They continued, to, they, or they continuously devoted themselves to. In Acts chapter 6, which we studied in our first uh, uh, service, we noted that they, they organized the church for what purpose? So that the, 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 the apostles could give themselves to what? The teaching of the Word of God. Uh, turn to Acts chapter 11. Now, we, we, these are all uh, words of example. And we'll come to some exhortation in, in just a few moments. But uh, uh, the, the first uh, large-scale Gentile evangelization took place uh, under Paul's uh, uh, first, uh, before Paul's first missionary journey at the Church of Antioch. We've seen that. We looked at the Church of Antioch in, in previous studies here. But in Acts 11, beginning in 19, Acts 11, 19, th we notice those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, Antioch of uh, Syria, uh, telling the message only to the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch, began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. There's the first part of the Lord's command, baptizing, evangelization, and response. Now, you see... Verse 22, news of this reached the ears of the church of Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit of faith, and a great number of people were brought, but he recognized his limitations. God bless the man who recognizes his limitations. And so, limitations, verse 25, then Barnabas went to Tarsus, and looked for Saul, when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. And then we notice, verse 26, that uh, for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The teaching of the great numbers of people now take place uh, by means of the, uh, the, at the first evangelization. Now, we don't have time. You can make a note of it, but there are Acts 14... 21 to 23, Paul's first missionary journey, after he had founded them, went back and confirmed them in the faith, means to fully establish, to make firm, to strengthen them, exhorting them to continue in the faith. Acts 15, 35, following the Jerusalem council, Paul and Barnabas stayed in, in, in Antioch. What did they do? What was their activity? Teaching and preaching, announcing. The, uh, there is no such difference between teaching and preaching. Acts 18, 11, Paul at Corinth on his second missionary journey, stayed a year and a half. What did he do? Teach. Acts 19, verses 8 to 10, Paul at Ephesus. What did he do? He reasoned, first of all, in the lecture hall, and then, uh, because the Jews' persecution for two years, he lectured, taught, and spoke uh, the Scripture there. Acts 20, verses 20, 21, and 26 to 32. Uh, we see how Paul said, I kept back nothing, that was profitable uh, to you. Uh, Barnes, in his uh, commentary on this passage, says, A minister of the gospel must be the judge of what will be profitable for his people. His aim should be to promote their real welfare, to preach that which will be profitable. His object will not be to please their fancy, to gratify their taste, to flatter their pride, or to promote his own popularity. Even if it be unpalatable, even if it be the language of reproof and admonition, if it be doctrine to which the heart is by nature opposed, if it run counter to the prejudices and passions of men, yet by the grace of God it should be and will be delivered. And uh, so we have uh, uh, 
a number of, of examples. Uh, we also find it in uh, examples in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, Colossians 1, 28, uh, Colossians 3, 16, and uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, 10, and uh, 1 Timothy 4, 6. All of these are examples of the Bible teaching in the early church. Now, I want to spend the rest of our time and finish this up by looking at the importance of doctrine being taught from direct statement. So the first were examples. So we can learn from the examples, but from the direct statements, we must learn from the mystery doctrine of the New Testament. We have to go into the places, and the, be the best place to look would be to find, if Paul wrote any letter to any pastors, <laughs> if, uh -huh, he did write to, to some pastors, Pastor Timothy and Pastor Titus, young, quote-unquote, depending on what age you are, uh, um, young men uh, to whom he is addressing uh, the Word of God. All right, let's turn then for, to, uh, to 1 Timothy First Timothy chapter 1. Timothy was the pastor at Ephesus. And he says in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 2, To Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia... Stay there in Ephesus, so that... Now then he gives him some information as to why uh, Timothy was to stay in that area. All right, first of all, so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrine. This is the word, the aorist passel, pardon me, the aorist participle from the Greek verb par- Angelo looks like this in the Greek. P A R A N G. Two G two G sound like an N G. E L L O. Obviously, you recognize this word right in the middle of it. But angel is again not a translation; it's a transliteration. Uh, the word, of course, uh, means to to. Uh, Communicate. Okay. The word angelo, a message, is, is a word, is a message. Hurrah is a preposition meaning alongside. To give a message alongside. It is uh, strictly used of commands which are given from a superior to an inferior. The aorist tense is, a, is the action of decisive action that was to take place. The aorist participle, again, precedes the action of the main verb, which we will notice. Uh, uh, but you'll see what he says. The first thing they are, he was to do uh, was to, uh, to admonish, to, to give a message to the ones who were in charge that they were not to teach any other doctrine. Uh, we have the word heteros here. There are two words for another. Uh, heteros, H-E-T-E-R-O-S, means another of a different kind. Alos, A-L-L-O-S, means another of the same kind. This is the word which is used here, a different kind of doctrine. Teach them that they are not to, uh, to teach other doctrines, uh, nor to devote themselves to myths uh, and to endless genealogies. Uh, that is... How many uh, angels can dance on the head of a pin? You know, some of the dumb things that people will uh, bring up. Uh, 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 who did, where did Cain get his wife? I mean, who, who cares? Don't lose your salvation worrying over some other man's wife, somebody said. Well, uh, you can't lose your salvation, so don't worry about it. But uh, what does it do? These promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by doctrine. 
It is by, God's work is done by means of doctrine, Bible doctrine. That which is believed, that which is believed is doctrine. All right, please notice 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Very simple passage. Very simple. He says, uh, uh, these things command and teach. Well, uh, the word isn't command. Parangelo again uh, means to, uh, to give, them, give the message alongside of something. And it, it has to do with okay, the repetition of, uh, uh, of the Word of God. Remember uh, what Paul said. Uh, you keep your finger here. We're going to come back to it. But it's so important. Uh, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write these same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Uh, and uh, again, uh, Peter, at a later time, uh, when he was uh, writing, uh, alludes to the same thing. Uh, for he, uh, he says, So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth that you now have. Uh, Peter was talking about repetition. Paul was talking about repetition. It is necessary for the repetition of the Word of God. And so these things command and teach and don't let anyone look down on you because you are young you see now verse 13 he goes on to say until I come devote yourself to and then he gives several things uh, the first thing that he gives uh, to, to give yourself devote yourself to is translated public reading but the word is uh, ana, uh, anagnosis looks like this in the Greek A-N-A-G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. Now, anagnosis, the verb is anagnosko. It means to distinguish between, to recognize, to know accurate, accurately. In post-classical Greek, it was used of reading aloud with comments. So it means to read plus comment on. We would say this would be the, the uh, common word for exegesis. Give your attendance to reading and commenting on the Word of God. Furthermore, the second word is paraklesis. P-A-R-A-K-L-E-S-I-S. -S. Paraklesis. Klesis means to call, para alongside, to call alongside. To call alongside uh, uh, would be to, to give application. You have to have exegesis to have application. So the first thing he's to give himself to is the exegesis of Scripture. The second thing is application of Scripture. But in addition to that, please note didascalia. D-I-D-A-S-K-A-L-I-A. -I -I Didaskalia. This is the systematic communication of doctrine. That's what that is. It's, it's doctrine. The emphasizing the systematic categorical communication of doctrine. And so here we have the plan for the pastor teacher. And it's very clear. Exegesis of Scripture. You go back to the original languages find out what it has to say and then you teach it comment on it illustrate it apply it and then teach the categorical doctrines which are related to it no question about what my job is it's right here as a matter of fact if you'll uh, if you take the book uh, the uh, teaching ministry of the local church you won't miss it because it is right there we also have a reference in first timothy 5 7, uh, in which the subject there uh, happens to be widows. Uh, 1 Timothy 6 2, uh, again, these things exhort and teach. And we have uh, the same thing. 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 Timothy 6 17, here is a charge to those who are rich. Now look at 2 Timothy for a moment, please, very quickly. 
In 2 Timothy, he begins in verse uh, chapter 1, verse 13, where he says, uh, Hold fast the pattern of sound or healthy doctrine which you have heard from the source of me. You see? And uh, verse 14, uh, 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 guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. But what I want to look at, I mean, just allude to that, and going, no, chapter 2, verse 2. This is a thrilling verse because it tells us what we're supposed to be doing. It says, um, and the things which you have heard of me, the doctrine which Paul the Apostle has taught, now he says, the thing which you have heard of me, you, that's Timothy, you are to teach others who will also have the ability to teach others. So you have here four generations. Paul teaches Timothy, Timothy teaches others, who shall also have the spiritual gift, the ability to teach others. That's thrilling, isn't it? This is the, the command to multiply the doctrinal ministry. Now, it is our job uh, to do that. And we seek to do it as much as we can. Uh, and, um, I consider Bill Gokenauer... Uh, the, uh, this generation here. Uh, I, have, I have learned, uh, not from Paul personally, but from the Word of God, and uh, uh, Bill is the third generation. I'm teaching him so that he can teach others uh, as well. And uh, this just doesn't have to stop, by the way, after four generations. Uh, notice in, in verses 14 and 15 of the second chapter, he says, Keep on reminding them of these things, Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It's of no value. It only ruins those who listen. In other words, don't strive about words, but to teach what is profitable. Verse 15, uh, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who is unashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Verses 24 and verse 25, in this same verse, and the Lord's servant must not quarrel, instead he must be kind apt to teach, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them change of mind, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. This is teaching, you see. Uh, teach, 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 teach. Uh, verse 26, that they may come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil. We also have it in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 17. Continue in the things you have learned, you have been assured of, uh, uh, knowing of whom you have learned them, that from a babe you have known the Holy Scriptures, and all Scripture is given by, uh, or as God breathed, and so forth. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, the final charge of the war horse before he goes to be with the Lord. He's about ready to be depart and be with the Lord. What's the last thing he thinks about? Uh, the old uh, uh, commander-in-chief, uh, writes to Timothy, In the presence of God and in Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, I give you this charge. Ch uh, verse 2. Preach the word. I referred to preaching before. This is the word in the Greek. K-E-R-U-S-S-O. K -E -R -U -S -S -O, K-Russo. Now, the English word brings to mind an ordained clergyman in his pulpit on the Lord's Day, ministering the Word of God. But the Greek word left quite a different impression on Timothy, for it spoke of the imperial herald who was charged by the emperor to proclaim a formal, grave proclamation it was to be listened to by those who heard it. It was to be uh, obeyed or heeded by those who heard it. It brought the picture of a town official uh, heralding a proclamation. And the meaning is to announce 
or to, uh, to uh, herald. And preaching is a terrible translation of this word. Uh, and uh, actually there are uh, 20 Greek words uh, which uh, can be translated preach, and God doesn't use them at all for preaching. They are all used in their detailed form. He says, so the first thing he is to do, uh, he is to announce. Kittle says it does not mean the delivery of a learned and deifying discourse in well-chosen and pleasant voice. It is the declaration of event. It is, uh, in a sense, it is a proclamation. Uh, Dr. Kent of Grace uh, uh, Seminary said he must announce it in its completeness without alteration, addition, or subtraction. He must proclaim, not philosophize. The message is the Word of God. To proclaim God's Word involves all the themes of Scripture, not picking out some and ignoring others. The Word of God in its entirety is the basic material of the preacher's message. And then he says how to do it. Be instant in season, out of season. Well, you know that that's uh, simply uh, an idiom which uh, says uh, that uh, they are to preach when it's convenient, preach when it's not convenient. Preach it when you feel like it, or announce it when you feel like it. Announce it when you don't feel like it. <laughs> announce it when the people want it and when they don't want it. Announce it when they are there in large numbers. Announce it when they are there in few numbers. The number of bodies in a pew do not make any difference. You're not teaching people. You're teaching as under the Lord for those who are on positive volition who want it. And then he says how to do it finally. Reprove the word elegco. E-L-E-G-C-H-O means a rebuke which results in a person's uh, conviction. So it's a strong word. Uh, okay. Reprove. Uh, rebuke, which is epitimao. E-P-I-T-I-M-A-O. Epitimao means a sharp, severe rebuke with the possibility of an impending penalty. Then he uses the word exhort. We've already seen it. Parakaleo, which uh, is uh, to, to uh, uh, apply. Application. And do it with what? Macrothomia. Patience. And what? And doctrine. Do it with patience and doctrine. Again, Dr. Kent says... There's a tendency to refer to doctrine as dry and academic. Yet doctrine is the teaching which God has revealed. We dare not preach anything else. To do so is to use man's wisdom. We should not let man, men who are careless with words, ruin this good term. The same is true, he says, of the word theology. Because the time is going to come, says verse 3, when men will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, they will heap to themselves teachers who will scratch their ears, teaching them what they want to hear, and therefore turning away from the truth toward fables. And so doctrine is imperative. It is imperative that doctrine be taught in the local church. Well, beloved, it's popular to be critical of the local church. It's popular for everybody to run around and tell the pastor what his job is supposed to be. But I'm here to tell you there's only one resource that tells me what my job is, and that is this book. Forty-three, going on 44 years, I have been teaching this book. A young Roman Catholic kid who didn't know Adam from Eve got saved one day, and someone stuffed a Bible in his hand a week later, it gave him a book and said, here, there are some kids here that need teaching. And I said, I don't know anything. Well, they said, if you don't, nobody will do it. And so I took the book and the book. And I taught. And my first class was 20 minutes long. I taught them everything I read. And I didn't know any more. I realized how little I knew. And eventually, you know, I went to Moody Bible Institute to study. But the point was... For, for 43 years, this has been my life. At 61, I, I don't know how much I have left, 
But I'm going to tell you this, every moment of time that I have left is going to be left in fulfilling the responsibility that God has given to me as a pastor of a local congregation of believers teaching the Word of God. The unsearchable riches of Christ, the infallible, inerrant Bible to people who want it. If they don't come, they don't want it. You know, who cares who doesn't come? What counts is who comes. They're the ones who want it. And they're the ones who will get it as long as they want it. And so the doctrine of the local church, wrapped up in about eight Bible classes for you, the local church, God's unique organism, with all its faults, with all its shortcomings, he has never started anything else. It's still his church. He's building it. It's not my job, not your job. It's his job. His job to build the local church. And not only this, but local churches, wherever they are, who are faithful to the Word of God. Well, in our next class, we will take up the, the next words, Paul writing to the churches of Galatia. We're going to study something about what Paul did when he first founded these churches in the area called Galatia. And you'll notice something very interesting about how those churches got started. It wasn't in Paul's plan. It was in God's plan. Thank you, loving Lord, for your matchless grace. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for all that you provide for us. We are total products of that grace. And we have a tremendous privilege. It's a great responsibility, yes, but it's a great privilege to have the Word of God to teach, to communicate to members of the human race who are part of your royal family, ones whom you love and therefore want to share your word with. So we, we, I sense the great of handling aright the Word of God and teaching your family. This is an awesome responsibility, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, an impossibility. But I thank you that until the Lord Jesus comes again, we can keep on keeping on doing this wonderful, glorious work. And I commit each one listening by radio, by television, or here in this audience to you, and ask that as they respond positively, meet the need in that soul. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.